The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Uh, we are particularly delighted tonight to have with us uh, Wu Man, world-renowned musician. She uh, was here, of course, last night for a performance in Bailey Hall with the Shanghai Quartet, uh, Shanghai String Quartet. Um, so some of you uh, I know were there and, and were lucky enough to see that. Uh, and it's really our good fortune that she uh, then agreed to come and talk to us here. Uh, Wuman has been in the States uh, since 1990 uh, and uh, has a large uh, and uh, impressive body of work uh, spanning that period of time and earlier. Uh, some things that I'm sure some of you have uh, encountered or uh, may have heard her work in include uh, a long cooperative, collaborative uh, project with the Kronos Quartet. Uh, also, she is one of the founding members of the Silk Road Ensemble uh, with Yo-Yo Ma and others, and they have the fourth uh, recording coming out this June, or is it, is that right? I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> Several yeah something like that. <laughs> uh, and a documentary fourth. as well yeah. uh, coming out about uh, the work of this group um, in June, so soon, June. coming this summer. Uh, so look for that. Others of you may more passively have heard her work in the soundtrack, as Nuyet points out to me, to uh, Kung Fu Panda 3, uh, <laughs> which Wu Man tells me was the first time that they actually used real musicians rather than synthesized versions of Chinese, <laughs> Chinese instruments. Uh, but uh, in many other uh, realms, you'll find her collaborations are, are diverse. Uh, and, and broad, uh, and as I said, we're just thrilled to have her. Uh, prior to coming uh, to the United States, uh, she was already a, uh, a phenomena in China. Uh, at the age of nine, you picked up the pipa for the first time, and her teachers uh, immediately realized that she was a child prodigy. By the age of, see if I've got this right, 13, you were accepted into the uh, Central into the Central Conservatory <laughs> in Beijing, so the most prestigious uh, institution for training musicians in China. Uh, so if you think about that, if you think about anything in your life that you picked up uh, one year and four years later you were at the most prestigious institution for, for in the world for, for that, uh, it's really a, 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 an enormously swift uh, trajectory, right? To, um, so uh, she studied there, uh, traditional Chinese music there, uh, and I would, I think it's fair to say, after coming to America, really sort of broadened out your interests. Uh, so I won't say anything more. Let's all welcome Wu Man. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Professor Robin mentioned. Uh, uh, by I was 13 and I picked uh, by the school in Beijing, the music school and uh, such a prestigious school, kind of like the conservatory in China. Um, for us, I, I, I know probably you kind of couldn't get the sense why so honored. I think uh, later 70s and early 80s, like some of you at the last concert and the a few string quartet member, we were same age, we were got the same school, we were classmates, literally. Um, even the second violin, we, we basically sat ne next to each other during our uh, middle school and high school year. Um, the reason I mentioned it because the, the education system is very, very different than, than America, but also even now, modern China, in those days are very different than 80s, 70s, um, when you picked by government, whatever we call the school, and got in the school, basically, you, that's your future. They decided your future. And because you're talented at a certain profession, like you're very musical, so they train you as a musician. If you're good at um, you know, swimming or that's very much like uh, um, you see a lot of good athletes from China. That's the, exactly the same kind of training process. Um, everything paid by government. And uh, basically family pays zero. And the government provides everything for you to train you, to educate you, 
and the purpose it was, um, and then you can pay back, we serve the country. <laughs> so that's very interesting that that time, uh, 70s, 80s, so I was the kind of that group of ta little kids, talented kids. So I just wanted to, um, when we talk about what am I going to talk to and uh, my, my musical education in China, and I just want to share with that. So that's very different than, than anywhere, probably very much in the early, early years, Chinese, um, especially musical education, the whole system, very much Soviet Union uh, system, we learned everything um, from them because um, a lot of professors, especially they play Western instruments like a pianist, violinist, they all early years they trained in the Moscow Conservatory. Um, so when, we, when they came back to, this, to China, so that's the whole, we decided everything, you know, what are we going to learn, how we train the kids. Um, pretty much very, very intense training. Um, I remember when I, middle school and then Besides my major, I, I decided that this is my major, this instrument is my major, but it's a Chinese, class, you know, Chinese classical instrument or Chinese traditional instrument. But besides that, we have to learn piano, very, very much piano. I play pretty good piano, and uh, I play Mozart concerto. Um, and then the, I remember once my piano teacher said it to me, said, oh, woman, do you want to switch your major to piano? And I think about overnight, I said, no. So I'm still, um, I, I feel very fortunate I decided not to switch to piano. Otherwise, there's no woman play the pipa. <laughs> um, and uh, besides your major, and we have, we have to learn everything in the high school, middle school. We have to learn Chinese, Chinese communist history, uh, uh, history of China, ancient history, math, everything. On top of that, we also have to learn uh, musical theory, air training, uh, all, the, all the basically uh, in the music school you taught course. And, uh, and then we basically have no um, um, free time to play. Like evening, after dinner, 5.30 is a dinner to 6.30. We have very much like in the army. That's the dinner time. All the kids go into the same place or um, cafeteria. And after that, 7 o'clock, by the 7 o'clock, you all again back to the class, 7 p.m. You study, which is because of the daytime you practice, you have your teacher, you know, face to face teaching you your instrument, but evening you have to do homework. And by 9 o'clock, um, you have to go back to your uh, dorm and 9.30, shut the lights. Basically, like today, <laughs> whole campus in the dark. But <laughs> we were like purposely shut because you have to, every kid you have to in the bed, you have to sleep. And then we, you can, we can chat in, in the room. If we chat too loud, we, I remember we were six kids in the one room, um, in a bumble bed. And if you talk too much, too loud, we have a nanny come over, knock your door, or just open your door, say, sleep. Um, and next day, 6 a.m., alarm starts, and we have to jump up the bed. And at 6.30, we have to all the outside the ground and do the physical, what's it called that? Um, yes. <laughs> and then we do everything, you know, physical kind of chain, and then running, and afterwards breakfast. So every day, just like in the army, um, sound like a very, um, I don't know, sound like a stranger to you, but it's such a memory for us, for, for my generation um, as a musician. In some way, actually, very fortunate we have that kind of training. And then we can um, come to the different country, basically for us, we can handle that hardness because we every time I said you know I remember so called ensemble we decided a um, few years ago we we toured it, Central Asia um, like Kazakhstan Uzbekistan um, Kyrgyzstan Azerbaijan all those stands country 
And I remember Yo-Yo Ma told me like, do you want to go? Are you sure? This is a very different country, you know, like a very, probably life situation, very different. I said, come on, I'm from China. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> I'm, I'm totally fine with that. So it was really fun, by the way, the trip. Um, and here we are, we talk about um, early education um, in China. So this is the instrument when I was nine years old, I picked up. Um, not I picked up, my parents picked up for me. Um, uh, some of you, you know, grew up in China, from China, you know uh, Chinese parents, uh, like tiger parents. <laughs> yeah, some laughing. Um, exactly the same, every, every family. Um, my, f my father uh, basically um, told me, he said, that we want you learn something, we want you learn traditional instrument. And uh, so here we are, this is the instrument you learn. Um, the reason because my father had a friend, he's a musician, he, he volunteered, he said he can teach. Um, again, in the old days, uh, when you have a private teacher in China, um, there's no, <laughs> you don't have to pay your teacher. You just offer a meal, give a, after the lesson, the teacher will stay at your house and have, have dinner, that's all. That's your kind of, your payback. Um, so that's how I learned it, this instrument. Um, um, any of you know Pipa before? Okay, uh, you heard the live concert, yeah? Uh, so probably half doesn't know. <laughs> um, so Pipa um, exists in China 2,000 years, very old, much older than guitar, uh, probably older than the European lute. Um, any of you play guitar or banjo or instrument? All right, good. <laughs> wow, okay. So you know the, what's the, um, how to play the instrument. Um, I'm totally wired here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Pipa um, introduced it to China through the Silk Road trade. So it's, it was from Central Asia, from Persian. Um, it's old instrument, not uh, was not Chinese invented. It's it's all kind of you know, travel. It's all related to each other. A lot of a lot of instrument, Central Asia, China, and and then, then travel to China and become pipa and in Japan they call biwa. It's the same instrument. Um, biwa kept the different version, kept the old, uh, much older version. But this version of pipa, my instrument. Um, it's pre pretty much 19th century version, Qing Dynasty, Qing Cao, uh, with the four strings and the pear shape, um, and the play. In the old painting, you see Chinese old painting, you see a lot of beautiful goddess women, they hold the instrument horizontal, and uh, that's ver pretty much an old version. And the Qing Dynasty, gradually, we hold the pipa straight, and uh, um, play with the fingers. Uh, also, old days you also play with a bigger plectrum, right? And uh, we we so this is the the way we develop the play the Chinese pipa and the sound of the instrument become very much Chinese. Um, and if you you see closer, I have sort of like a fake fingernails on my fingers on right hand. I uh, use tape taped on. <laughs> Um, this is the, uh, also again, this is a much later version to use the fake fingernails. Um, most of my teacher, they uh, use natural fingernails. Um, during 1950s, 60s, we changed the strings. We changed the string. Old days, we used the silk strings. And then, got nylon. And the 50s, 60s, we changed it to steel strings, like metal strings, like a guitar. Um, and so we need much louder sound. But during that time, not only pipa, a lot of other Chinese traditional instrument, they sort of changed. Some instrument, they make a body bigger, 
everything the purpose is want to be louder sound. Um, because you know a lot of revolution song you have to play in a <laughs> big setting, <laughs> not like old days. P pipe is sort of like a ching right? being played. Uh, seven strings zero. It's more scholar type, uh, more kind of intellectual type instrument, and uh, very intimacy the way you play in a small setting, not for the bigger public, but 60s, 50s, everything want to be louder. Um, <laughs> And uh, we use very much just like uh, um, uh, pharmacy, you know, medical tape, taped on five fingers. So this is the only way right now play the pipa. Nobody uses natural fingernails anymore. Uh, I started learning, I use this fingernails. Um, mm -hmm. So the way we put the fingernails, is, which is on the, string, uh, on, the, on, the, on the fingernail side, not like a guitar. Guitar you use mid side to play, right? You use this way. But pipa, everything is out. Yeah. Everything is out. Um, uh, some of you probably heard yesterday concert. I played a solo piece, which is a very typical uh, pipa language or I would say very typical Chinese music, one of the style, uh, we call lyrical style, wen qu in Chinese code. Um, um, it's very interesting, um, Chinese music always have uh, beautiful poetic titles, not like Western music, they mostly, you know, symphony number what? Number three, number four, and sometimes B minor or something. You know? um, but for us, the first time I heard the West, I'm like, where is the title? There's no title. Uh, <laughs> but um, somehow Chinese music always have a beautiful title. I think kind of give you the direction um, to listen to, kind of give you the hint, give you imagination to. Um, so so the, the lyrical style you hear yesterday, um, for the pipa uh, technique, a lot of right hand, uh, left hand technique, a lot of details on the left hand, vibrato, bending the notes, harmonic. Um, often Chinese music, notes between notes, there are a lot of empty space. There is a silent. Um, that silent also a part of music. Um, it's, it's like a Chinese painting, very different. I always talk about, if you see Western painting, mm -hmm. everything full color, right? It's, 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 a, it's a full picture there, everything edge. It's always beautiful, a lot of things on, on the, the painting. But the Chinese painting, the, especially the traditional um, black and ink, that painting always is so many space white, just paper, nothing else, like this one. Probably little tree, some water, something little boat there, and the water. They never, never really paint the water. You just imagination that's water because there's a boat there, or sometimes you can imagine that's kind of the sky. So, it very much like like music. Um, I just give you for example this lyrical style.
Thank you. So you, 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 you see a lot of vibrato, but sometimes a lot of time afterwards. So for listener, you really kind of, we never give you everything as a performer. We kind of drag you coming to listen to the detail. Still there, always like a even f finish. So, st so kind of we we all sort of kind of those taste. <laughs> it's like it's like food, you know. Um, you have little sauce, little some other. So you you taste that. That's kind of the um, the tricky thing of you listen to um, Chinese traditional music. Um, very different than other culture like African music, you can get up dancing. Um, and South America, you know, jazz, you can dance. But Chinese music, especially from the other side, this side of the globe, not only China, probably Japan, Korea, a lot of the time you have to sit down, you have to really kind of taste those, those detail. Um, so that's very different, very interesting if you think about it, the culture, the music, um, painting sometimes, very different. Um, so for this instrument, we have another totally opposite style, which is what we call uh, martial style, wu qu, very martial, <laughs> um, which is very much a left hand, uh, right hand, I'm sorry, right hand technique, like a flamingo guitar. Um, a lot of uh, very dramatic and percussive. Again, the piece always with the titles, but the music always describe or imitate a different sound, it imitate the battles. And a lot of people know there is a Chinese famous, the pipa piece called Shi Mian Mai Fu or Ambushed from Ten Sides. Um, that's the piece, uh, which is martial style. So for this hand, a lot of, you know, like, that's very much like a flamenco guitar, right? Uh, and then when I play this um, ambush, I remember early years I play and people were coming to me, they said it sounds like a rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> like, and then a lot of like different percussive stuff. And, that kind of very, very dramatic. Um, so the language of this instrument kind of, uh, I always say very, for me, very fortunate, you know, this is a, such a rich uh, uh, a language of this instrument. So, and then when I moved here, um, a lot of composer interested in this instrument and because it's such, different, you know, could be very dramatic and very percussive and also could be very beautiful, elegant. So they, they like, they kind of like a f discovered a different color um, of their, so they can use those two to paint their, their music. Um, so which is, to me, which is a very nice fortune to have that opportunity. Um, um, so pipa is still quite, uh, uh, I think, still very popular in China. Um, a lot of young kids, they, they're learning this instrument, uh, including other traditional instruments as well. Um, and uh, I want to show a little bit uh, the uh, video, uh, the documentary film, which is a small part of that, which I filmed um, when I back to China. I made a couple of trips. Um, because I want to show you, um, like, most of us probably in the West, we know Chinese music or Chinese ensemble, the instrumentation, probably pipa and the zither and dulcimer, maybe flute, and then the string instrument called arhu, uh, di zi, which is a bamboo flute, uh, zhen, which is 20, 21 strings zither, but Old days only 16, and again during 50s, 60s we add more. And uh, last year I went back to China; they have 24 strings. So I don't know. Maybe next few years will be 30 strings. <laughs> and uh, 
um, very much like urban music. We popular in the city and in trend in the people learn in the conservatory. Um, but I want to show something from a, from a rural China, which is a Chinese folk music. Um, the reason I want to show um, because every time I, I people always ask me like um, the same question probably you will get to like tell me what is Chinese music. So I'm asking you, tell me what is American music? What is American music? Banjo. Banjo is an instrument. You mean yeah. bluegrass music? Bluegrass okay, when that's one, that's one you just pop out of your head, it's a bluegrass. What about jazz? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's the same question asked when people ask me. I stuck. I said, well, this one is Chinese, but not only, right? Like banjo is not only, bluegrass is not only Ch American music, but they have different instrumental, vocal, folk songs, so many different things. So I went back to China. I was back in 2006, 2007, and 8, and 9. Um, so I made this documentary film. I went to Shanxi and Shanxi. Anybody you know where is Shanxi? Everybody knows. Okay, where is Shanxi? Nobody. Okay, I miss a little kid in there. <laughs> um, and uh, um, there's folk. I have a little, uh, show you the Shanxi one. Um, Shanxi area, they have specialty, their puppets, shadow puppets uh, in that region near Xi'an uh, in Huaying. And uh, um, this band, this family last name Zhang, Zhang Jiaban, this family now, I think they got very, very well known now in China um, because of the Chinese New Year, uh, what's called the Chun uh, Jie Wan Hui, the New Year on the TV, New Year program, because they played with a rock and roll singer. Um, so in China, they call them Lao Qiang, but I call them Zhang family band. Basically, that's their uh, shadow puppets style. Huaying region, located on the banks of the Yellow River, was the capital of the West Han Dynasty in 206 BC. It has a very old tradition of shadow puppetry with a unique vocal style. Thank <laughs> you. 
，我们这大部分都是这样的，本家的，哎，因为这个西这个地方新疆人民，哎，新疆人比较多，百分之八九十都是新疆的，哎，他过去就光怕这男的不怕女的。一般也不外发，更不外发。你一般在外边这发的也有，你或者是操作皮影的，拉板会的，打板子中人的，他穿。一般主唱的东西穿。闺蜜党也也偏手枪了，每个中间留着呀，枪那个是他搞那个宣传队，啊，关于宣传毛子的思想，学习教育了，学习文化了，那个，哎呀，唱的是老，谁谁谁，刘青队，一池刘青队，在那个杨板剧嘛，啊，杨板剧，哎，这群有虎啥的，对对对，这这这这这，红灯记，红灯记啊，棒了。用那个那个老老腔子唱法唱，哎，用老腔唱，啊，用老腔唱，还是演皮演演皮演皮演皮。过去的不要拿唱的原因，演段剧，你歌词不能更改，对，这个就把你烦死了。你过去老戏，你还有些老剧本就可以随便，我就就不行，我把这个切掉，我就可以加词加词就能行。演段剧那是不叫你切，不叫你加。都叫我打，打的时候，你打你就打你，啊，就打你，啊，打呀，哎，就打你，真的不打，哎，第一枪，要你看，中音，中音枪，哎。Now in his 80s, Bai Mao represents the oldest generation to carry on this ancient musical style. He told me he has no students, and in recent years, he's had less chances to perform.
丰一点，生意的啊，啊，有这个高编织的，嗯，还有这个在外边打工的，哦，搞建筑的，搞建筑的，啊。他知道这些东西，他就历史这些东西他知道。年轻人他不懂，他看一看，在那块说的比较文雅的比较多一点，他看看看不懂听不懂他就不看了。你到这个程度了，你如果再保守，这个可能从连自己的儿子都不需要。After hearing Ximin's concerns, I couldn't wait to meet his grandson, a fifth grader who is studying the family tradition with his grandfather. He is a bright hope for the future. I have returned to my homeland to document the roots of traditional Chinese music, the music I love, before it disappears forever, to discover people and sounds which perhaps had never been known outside the small villages of China. I'm excited because I know there is still more to find here. <laughs> so um, I so this is actually very recently. This is a 2008 when the Olympic Olympiad game in China. I basically I went back to Beijing uh, the last day of Olympia game. At this, I think they finished, and then I got out of out of flight in Beijing and then um, stay overnight and got on a, um, a, a car and we drove to this village. Um, so this film only um, two people made it, myself and the uh, uh, photographer, I mean uh, cameraman, um, just two of us. And we drove the, um, all the places in, in the countryside. Um, again, they, you see their, um, their tradition. This is only one part. I also, in the film, I have went to different places in Shanxi and in Dao, Daoist, Daoism band music. And also um, Shanxi, there's a Shan band or the wind percussion instrument. Um, so in the tradition, a lot of Chinese music, they, as I mentioned yesterday too, um, there's no notation, you know, no, no scores. We are it's all oral tradition. So when I want to try to learn from them, you know, they, they said, we don't know, we, they sing it to me. And I use a paper at the last, very last, you see, I use paper to write down something. But they play every time they change. 
not follow. <laughs> yeah, so that's very much the folk tradition. Um, I think it's the same thing as uh, any other country. A um, lot of lot of older tradition fades into uh, to dying. Um, but fortunately, this band um, they're kind of getting popular because that um, I invited them 2009, 2010. Um, come to New York, Carnegie Hall, play at the, the Carnegie Hall um, China Festival. And uh, a very, very interesting, lot of stories behind because they never left the village, they never even on the airplane. Um, so we have someone to went to China to take them from small village and they kind of lost everywhere. <laughs> it was so cute. And then the hotel, <laughs> hotel they put, a, put them in at the Times Square Hotel somewhere in New York. It was in the evening time. Oh, gosh, <laughs> so overwhelming for them. And uh, so they, they want to smoke because in the village they smoke. <laughs> so in the hotel room, you can't. And then they all got out of the hotel and the light on the street, they were all, you know, they, Traditionally, they all kind of like, you know, <laughs> start smoking. And people passing, and they look at all the lights, and people passing looking like 10 Chinese older guys smoking right there. <laughs> and so funny. And they also looking, everyone's different. They're also enjoying that. It was a beautiful moment. I wish I could have filmed that, um, but I didn't. Um, but anyway, um, so when after that, they, they went back to China, they became a hero in their village, in their state, in their... Uh, um, so government um, decided, uh, gave, actually gave them money to ask them to uh, teach next generation. If anyone wanted to, to learn from them that singing style, that um, especially the shadow, you know, puppetry thing. Um, so they're actually in the, in, I would say in, in somehow in a good uh, uh, position right now, good situation than other tradition, other and band in a small village. So this is one of the example of Chinese folk music in a, in a small village. <laughs> Thank you.